is good once again to welcome you this morning, and I particularly uh, want to welcome those who might be first-time guests with us today. We're glad that you're here and pray that God's Spirit might be uh, evident as we worship our Lord and Savior. I would like to invite you, if you are at the end of the row, would you take the blue paths that are there and pass them down the row and and uh, register your attendance. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you could do it online at stmorscarmel.org slash attend. And uh, in both cases, it's helpful for us to know that you're here, as well as giving you an opportunity if you have pastoral needs or concerns, there's a, a place there that you can uh, share those with the, the, the staff. As uh, is uh, typical of our week, I'd like to draw your attention to the blue center section of the bulletin. There are a couple of things that are coming up that uh, I want to highlight. Um, On February 13th, we'll be having the St. Mark's Talent Show. So uh, I I jokingly said a couple weeks ago, dust off your accordion if you have one. No. Uh, Whatever talent you may have, feel free to to share that. But uh, if you want to be a part of the talent show, and we hope that you do, you need to let Eric DeForest know so that he can uh, plan that e- uh, afternoon. That'll be on February 13th at 2 p.m. We also have a chili cook-off, another fellowship event coming on February 27th at 5. five. I noticed there was a sign-up sheet for that out in the gathering area as well. There are a number of service opportunities, and one of them is a blood drive, which we'll be hosting in two weeks. Again, there is a sign-up sheet in the uh, gathering area and is, has been typical for our recent experience. There's a, an urgent need for uh, blood donors right now as hospitals are, are uh, running out of, of uh, usable blood. We will continue to uh, receive in-kind donations for Wheeler Mission, and there's more information about that in the bulletin. And uh, we had planned to host Interfaith Hospitality Network uh, uh, in March, or February or March, but uh, they, they have suspended their in-church hosting right now, so we will support them financially as they uh, host people in uh, other ways, and so we want to invite you to uh, continue to make donations, but we will not be hosting them until uh, COVID settles down a little bit. As always, uh, if you're in person, we have a ways to uh, serve uh, part of the bulletin here. There are a number of different ways that uh, you can uh, help in various specific ways. So if you want to fill that out, you can put that in the offering baskets that are back of the church. This is also where you could put your mission offering if you so choose. Our mission of the month this month is Mission uh, Guatemala. We've talked about it the last several weeks. Uh, Mission Guatemala is a United Methodist-related organization with a mission to help meet the basic needs and improve the quality of life of underserved Guatemalan people. Uh, We've had a relationship with Mission Guatemala for a number of years. I know there are several people here who have traveled there, including myself, so we want to continue to support them. All of these are ways that we uh, just uh, continue to join together and continue to strive to make St. Mark's a place where Mission is a way of life. At this time, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to this morning's Old Testament lesson that uh, Dean is going to read for us. The Old Testament lesson comes from chapter 8 of Nehemiah. You can either follow along in the boards or you can find it in your pew Bible in the Old Testament, page 692. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read it from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, amen, lifting up their hands. 
Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. At this time, I'd like to invite us to a time of prayer. And as, as is our custom, uh, we'll begin with a time of silent prayer in which uh, we share our silent petitions to God and in which we invite God to speak into our hearts and minds. So let us uh, be in silent prayer together, and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. Let us pray. God of prophets and apostles, you call us to restore that which is broken and to proclaim your vision of a world made new. Create in us new hearts and strong voices as we pray. God, fill us with the power of your spirit. We pray for those who have been anointed or chosen as leaders of people, that they may attend to the voices of their people and be guided by you. We pray for pastors and teachers of the church that they may faithfully interpret your word for others. We pray for those who are poor and in need of assistance and for ourselves that we may open our hearts to their cries for help. We pray for those who are the captives of war and the victims of violence. May we bring them good news, both in word and deed. We pray for those with physical challenges and spiritual struggles. Make us agents of healing and hope. We pray for those who are oppressed by powers beyond their control. Give us courage to work to set them free. God of the Jubilee, make us the body of the risen Christ, united in all our diversity. Animate us by your Holy Spirit, that together we may work toward your coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray as disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Natalie and Ross. We appreciate beautiful music. I do want to say a word. Uh, we did hire a new organist uh, a little while back, and he will be starting February 1st. We really, I, I just want to say a word of appreciation for Roz as she has carried us through. And she has come out of retirement and carried us through this interim time, so thank you, Roz. Uh, Roz is a delight to work with and always uh, wonderful to hear you play. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we hear this morning's gospel lesson, which comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 4, verses 14 uh, through 21, Uh, a story of Jesus uh, coming to his hometown to preach and uh, kind of what happens next. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed be free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I suspect many, if not all, preachers can remember that time when they went back to their home church to preach. Uh, Matter of fact, I preached my first sermon there in January of 1983, so it's been a little while. Uh, and then I was fortunate uh, about 10 years ago to, to come back, or not quite 10, because uh, to come back and preach for their 50th anniversary of the founding of the church. And so uh, I was, uh, but I will tell you that whether I was preaching in 1983 or 2013, uh, once I entered the church building, I am about 12 years old in the, in the minds and sight of almost everybody Uh, who I knew before I entered ministry. Uh, It is hard in a lot of ways for them uh, to to let me grow up. And even though they're very proud of me and and wish me well, uh, they still reminisce about the things I did when I was in junior high school, something that most of us don't really want reminisced uh, about. Uh, And I suspect there was a little bit about of that when Jesus came home to his church or the synagogue in Nazareth. Nazareth uh, is not a small town. As a matter of fact, when he preaches in Capernaum, Capernaum is much smaller, probably about 3,000. Nazareth was described uh, as a polis, which means it's, it was probably had at least 20,000 people there. It is on a hillside in Galilee, and uh, one of the distinctive things I remember about visiting Nazareth is there is a church there with, which has an artesian well, so a, a well of water. It's the only one in the area. And because of that, the town probably would have been a built around this source of water. And you can, and when you visit the Holy Land, you can have these, uh, you know, low probability, probable, high probability, pretty certain sort of, you know, ways that guides will often say this. Very certain that Jesus at some point drank water from this well because it would have been the only fresh water uh, source there. So that's, that's kind of cool. Today, Nazareth is a city of about 175,000 people, so it's a much bigger city, still on the hill. And if you go down the, to the valley and back up, there's a little mount there with a cliff that overlooks the Valley of Jezreel, which is a, a large, flat uh, valley that's agricultural today. And in other places in the New Testament, that valley is called Megiddo, or you may know it better as Armageddon. So it's the valley that is uh, uh, proposed as the, the place of the final uh, battle when, when God sets everything right. So this is all in very close proximity 
Jesus is in Nazareth. He comes to the synagogue, and there is a history of reading Scripture in the synagogue. As a matter of fact, Dean kind of read one of the precedences for that from the book of uh, Nehemiah, where Ezra comes and opens the scroll and reads to the people, and the people are so happy to hear the word read that they wept. Now, I've never had anybody weep when I read, but, uh, but I think that's pretty cool. So Jesus comes, there, there, the, the order of worship in a synagogue normally would have been there would be a, a um, uh, they would recite the Shema together. Remember, O oh Lord, Lord Israel, our God is one God, and you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then they would often recite a psalm together, and then they would read a reading from the prophets, and that's where we were in the course of the worship service. Jesus uh, was called upon to, kind of as the visiting, returning uh, son, was called upon to read from the prophets, and he got up. Now, we don't know, uh, we don't have a biblical record of whether this was a, a, a reading that was sort of like our lectionary readings, the reading for the day or whether Jesus selected this particular reading. But either way, he got up and he read some from Isaiah 6, uh, which, you know, the year of the Lord is upon you to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, all of these things. And that was not unusual. As a matter of fact, it would have been very common for someone to read and then put down the scroll and then expound upon him. What was unusual is Jesus completed the reading, and then he said, let me tell you that today... This reading has come to, come to fruition in your presence. It has come true in your presence. Now, that would be like me getting up and reading uh, a prophecy and saying, all right, today it came true. Here I am. Now, I suspect some of you might have lunchtime conversations about that if I did that, if not more. And so that was the startling point. People in Jesus' time would not have been uh, averse to saying, of course, God will bring about God's promises in God's time, and uh, we well know these promises will, will eventually happen. But for Jesus to say, here, now, right now, in me, this has been fulfilled, that was startling news. And so the story progresses. They grab him. They plan to stone him. Now, in, in the Bible, there are two ways you could be stoned. And it, one is that people would throw stones at you, and the other is they would throw you at stones. Uh, in other words, throw you over a cliff. Uh, either way, it was not good for you. You know, uh, the stones were going to win in that equation. So in this case, they decided they'd take him to this cliff over the Valley of Jezreel, and they'd throw him off, and he miraculously escapes. So there's this wonderful uh, story. And then he goes on and, and preaches throughout Galilee. Now, this is a, a, an interesting story. It has a lot of facets, but it particularly is interesting because of where it is placed in the Gospel of Luke. Immediately before this story is the story of the temptations in the wilderness. Now, that's a story we'll talk about. That's always read the first Sunday in Lent, so we'll read that in a few weeks. But there is this story about the temptations in the wilderness in which Jesus is tempted, and he is able to say no three times to these temptations that are uh, given to Satan to, to tempt him with. And so, there is the kind of, here's what I'm saying no to, and all of a sudden we move to Nazareth, and this is kind of the, okay, this is what I'm saying yes to. This prophecy about feeding the poor, release to the captives, giving sight to the blind, and, and you know, this, uh, this uh, message. Many scholars propose that this is probably Jesus' mission statement. This is Jesus saying, this is what my mission will be, is to fulfill this prophecy that I have come to, to do these things that the prophet uh, proposes for us to do. If that's true, and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, support for it being true, then it means that we will probably want to pay particular attention to this. If this is what Jesus is saying at the beginning of Luke, this is what the rest of Luke will be about as he, uh, as he uh, goes about his life and ministry, then maybe we should pay some attention to what Jesus is proposing in this passage. Uh, 
Jesus comes, he, he reads, he, uh, he proposes this. So there is, this is an important moment in his life, and it makes us reflect on a couple of things. First of all, we have to reflect on the idea of how well are we living out this mission that Jesus proposes for himself, which we assume if it's important to him, it should be important to us. And then how well do we also search out and ascertain our own uh, mission statement, our own uh, thing that God is calling us to do? A few years ago, I was uh, in South Dakota, and I was with a friend of mine who was a pastor then at Winter, South Dakota, which is like right in the middle of the state, just south of the midline interstate. And we decided to go to the Black Hills to see... um, the, you know, to see Mount Rushmore, and then we came back through the Badlands, so we had a nice little time. We took the interstate over, which is the fastest way, and he said, well, let's, let's go home. We're going to go home through the Badlands, but let's take a state highway that's not an interstate, you know, kind of a lesser highway. I said, fine. I, you know, I don't know about here. Well, I can tell you, anybody ever been to South Dakota? Yeah, there's a lot of land, So we got on this highway, and, and we, we drove home several hours, and I, I, I'm not kidding, we saw many more mule deer than we saw cars or people on this drive home. Uh, really, no one. But one of the th- conversations we had was, you know, what I imagine this was uh, in, in the summer. I thought, what would this drive be like in the middle of winter in South Dakota? Because it gets cold there. I've heard stories from my friend. And he said, here's one of the things that you have to learn about South Dakota. And I had a, uh, uh, another person that said this is true in Texas as well, where there's also lots of land. And uh, <clears throat> he said, in the, particularly in the middle of winter, if, a car, if you come upon a car that is broken down alongside of the road, you are duty-bound to, to stop and offer assistance because you don't know when the next car is going to come along. And he said, even if it is your worst sworn enemy, you stop. Because you don't know when they will have the next assistance they will have. And this was before cell phones and things as well, so, or the proliferation of cell phones. So, um, and I've, that's always stuck with me. And I thought, in a lot of ways, as I think about our vocation as Christians, it's that really should be our way of operation uh, uh, in our world today. It's that when we see someone in need, we should offer assistance. You notice when Jesus reads this prophecy, it doesn't say, help the poor who need help and, and seem to deserve it. Offer Uh, good news to the captives who have behaved well in captivity. You know, there's no qualifications here. It just says to offer compassion in this way. And that sometimes is a difficult thing for us to do, in part because we don't always recognize who is in need of help. I read a book a few years ago by a man named Tim Dearborn, and, and he talks about he was a pastor. He went to Scotland to preach at a church in Scotland or preach in several churches, and he was on some, one Sunday morning picked up by his ride to church who was a, a seminary student who had been a, a sheep farmer for herder for several years, a couple of decades, and now was a second career person who was going to seminary to be a pastor. And they were driving through the countryside toward their, the church where he was going to preach that morning. And all of a sudden, this, uh, this driver, this seminary student uh, who was uh, accompanying him stopped the car, and he said, we've got to stop the car. And he got out, he climbed over one of the, the fences into an open field, and uh, Tim Dearborn watched him. And after a few minutes, he came upon a sheep that was upside down. And he said, you know, uh, and he turned it over, and the sheep lumbered off. And he came back to the car, and he said, you know, if a sheep has not been sheared yet, it's full wool, and it gets upside down, it can actually, it can't get itself turned back over sometimes, and it can actually suffocate because it can't get uh, right side up. And Tim Dearborn, as they got back and, and continued along their way, he thought to himself, here's the, here's the thing that takeaway for him from that experience was 
he was looking at these open fields and they were beautiful and he was looking at the the natural beauty of those fields, he never would have spotted this upside down sheep. His eyes were just not trained to do that. But he said this this, uh, former shepherd who was watching the fields immediately noticed that there was this sheep in distress and went and helped him. I think there is some truth to that in the way that we look at our world around us is that we can really uh, sometimes have an inability to see people who are in distress around us, in part because people who are in distress often look just like people who are not in distress. I've been doing this long enough to know that in a room this size and with people watching on the live stream, I can tell you that someone in this room is having a hard time. Someone in this room is in distress right now. And that there are other people in our lives who may look differently than we look, may act differently than we act, maybe of a different uh, ethos or, or persuasion in terms of philosophy of the world. or And some of them may be in distress as well, but we have difficulty in seeing them. When the prophet Isaiah in this passage that Jesus read says to him, I have come to give sight to the blind, I don't think that he's necessarily talking about physical sight. I think he is in many ways saying, I am giving you insight to be able to see those people in your midst who are in distress. A few years ago, I heard a a preacher friend, Fred Craddock, uh, who I've mentioned before, is one of my favorite preachers, but he told a story uh, or or gave us this insight, which uh, as as preachers-to-be, he was teaching a seminar, and he said, one of the things you have to remember uh, and why he doesn't tell jokes, now there's a difference between using humor and telling jokes, but he said, anytime you tell a joke, there will be somebody in your congregation who cannot laugh at that joke who will find it too painful to laugh at that joke. And the reality is that there are people in our lives who need release from their captivity, who need healing for their infirmity, who need someone to reach out to them in a caring way. And so this passage from Jesus reminds us that that we participate in this mission statement of Jesus as well, that, that this is a big part of who we should be and can be if we give the power of the Holy Spirit uh, its due. One of the uh, important qualities of these two stories that are back-to-back is that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and then Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into Nazareth and beyond. And one of, the, uh, one of the commentators on this passage said, here's how you can tell if you are attuned to the Holy Spirit in your life is if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something and gives you the time and capacity to do it, you are probably being led by the Holy Spirit. Each of us has a mission uh, or part- we, each of us participates in the mission of God if we give ourselves to that, if we say, like Jesus, no to the temptations and yes to the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Queen Elizabeth of Belgium, during the height of the Cold War, was making a diplomatic visit to Moscow. And she decided she was a, a very faithful Roman Catholic, so she was uh, going to Mass one Sunday morning, and there was a political liaison who accompanied her to Mass, who rode with her uh, to Mass. And she was having a conversation with this political liaison, and she said to him at some point, so, um, are you Catholic? And he said, believing but not practicing. And she said, well, then you must be communist. And he said, practicing but not believing. This story of Jesus in his first uh, preaching engagement at his home church reminds us to be both believing and practicing. It is important what we believe, but it's also important how we 
practice what we believe. It's important to hear the words of the prophet, but it's also to, important to put those words into practice. And I have noticed through the years that uh, we are more apt to do the things that we say out loud, that we, we make a vocal commitment to, we are more apt to have people uh, hold us accountable and God hold us accountable to that. So Jesus is doing something important here. He's saying it out loud. He's saying, this is what I came to fulfill. This is my purpose. And so it begs the question of us, What are we willing to fulfill? What is our purpose? And how are we willing to be participants in the purpose that Jesus outlines here through the prophet, saying that we are here to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, the year of God's jubilee. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, open our eyes, open our hearts, hearts, Help us to see your purpose and then give us the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to fulfill your purpose in our time and in our world. We know that ultimately it is only you that can set things right, but you call us to be co-participants in that setting right as we, uh, as we love one another, as we uh, share in this liberating message which you gave Uh, through the prophet to this synagogue and to us throughout the generations. We pray that through your spirit we might uh, participate in this mission and ministry that you have outlined in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, Wonderful Words of Life, as we are reminded that these words have power as we put them into practice. And now let us go in the power and presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us go filled with the Holy Spirit to be God's messengers and agents as we participate in this mission and ministry that Jesus has outlined. Let us go in God's peace. Amen.